there have been many civilizations from Lemuria to At to Atlantis uh, to the Egypt. I mean, ancient Egypt. There's nothing left of it, um, and we've lost so much knowledge, so much knowledge that we were given. And there have been so many lies, and that's why it's all that illusion. So much has been kept from us, um, just so that we do not go back to living in harmony with one another, that we remain separate, and then we remain under the control of uh, those in power, so to speak. But actually, do they really hold power over us? Hi, Brigitte. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Shifting Dimensions. I'm really excited to speak with you. Um, you're a light empowerment coach, divine channel, and light language healer, and an author. So yes. you have quite a few things under your belt. And I want to start off with what made you decide to write your book, Becoming Authentically Me? What made me write the book? Well, it wasn't really me writing it. I, I suppose my guides telling me, Brigitte, you're going to sit down and write the book. It was like a nudge from the universe. But I mean, I started writing it in 2000 and then I left it because, you know, I had to go through a lot more um, a lot more trauma and overcome my trauma, a lot more experience. And so when COVID hit, um, it was really like my guide set me down. I mean, I just started a new corporate job and I was like, they want me to write, finish writing this book. And then it wasn't like, it consisted of two parts. So the first part was all about the shift in consciousness and what was happening in the world and why things were happening. And I'm like, this is going to be a big book. And they were like, you're going to write it. So I sat there, you know, at night after work till late. And I got up early in the morning and I just, you know, I just wrote whatever um, I was guided to write. Um, it was very empowering for me. It was very healing for me as well, because I learned so much. You mean, it was, it was amazing. Um, it was like I, I downloaded so much knowledge. And yes, as I put in, in my book as well, and as I always say, I'm just here to plant that food for thought seed for people to awaken to what life is all about. And if it resonates with you, that's great. And if it doesn't, that's okay too. We're each on our own journey. Yes, and you do write that in the book. And I'm, I'm going to read that quote a little bit later. But to your point about the book being in two parts, I noticed that the first part of the book or book one seemed to focus on the existence of earth and what this whole plane or realm was for and then it seems like part two was more focused more into your story um and also other metaphysical concepts were weaved into in other metaphysical concepts were weaved into that section as well and yes there was a lot of channeling that was in the book as well so could we talk a little bit about the first part of the book because that kind of both parts sparked my interest but I was very very curious about the whole birthing or like the existence of this earth in this plane what do you think what have you channeled in regards to the purpose of our existence and why we're here because that's one of the biggest questions we're all trying to answer whether it's through religion whether it's through spirituality whatever you want to call it so I just want to hear a little bit more about that I get asked that question a lot why are we here why are we here well why are you here <laughs> we're here several well several things but the main thing is that we're here to return to that love for ourselves and each other and as you know we live in a social construct a societal construct a paradigm so to speak and it's one of the things I always say to people we live in a terrorized earth and we live in a terrarium in a glass box mm -hmm. and you know we have to hop out of that glass box and understand that everything is actually an illusion and that there is so much more to life second we are divine alchemists and when I talk about alchemy of course I work a lot with the Saint Master Saint Germain but when we talk about alchemy, it's really the transformation of human character. We are energy. Yeah, we are not this blob of organism. Yeah, I mean, we are the light within this physical embodiment or this meat suit. Our light is zipped up in it. 
And we have the opportunity to live and to breathe and to just be grateful for all that we have in life. We are here to transcend the ego. And the ego is just this little freak up there. Yeah. And um, it commands, it, it tells you what to do. Now it's okay to have a little bit of that ego, but I always say the ego is ejecting God out. So it's we've it's almost like we've unplugged from source and we've got to plug that in. And going back to alchemy, so everything that we go through, the heaviness is the lead. And when we transmute all that pain, the hurt, and everything that we've gone through. It becomes that gold and we become more enlightened about life. We understand life more. And that's one of the reasons that we go through all these experiences. Now, there's also, of course, Mother Earth. And Mother Earth is a living, breathing, conscious being, just like we are. I mean, Mother Earth was created over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And we... I mean, she has allowed us to gracefully walk upon upon the soil, you know, upon her soil, so to speak. And right now she is shifting. She's also shifting. She's growing. And so too, we have to grow. And that's one of the reasons that there is so much going on. There's so much suffering because everything is just bobbing to the surface and people need to need to heal and awaken understand what life is all about because this is not it we live in a massive illusion we get fed so much information yumi that is such i mean so many people ingest it thinking that is the reality but actually it's not it's an illusion it's like the whole of laughing mirrors yes and can you kind of expand on what you mean by we are living in an illusion, right? So I've heard people say that a couple of different times. And some people will say the illusion is believing that we are separate from one another, right? Yep. Um, some mm -hmm. people might say that it's an illusion because we're in a matrix and all yes. of these different things are being shown to us, but that's not the reality of what this world is. So when you are talking about us living in an illusion, what are you specifically alluding to? Again, yeah, so you've you've hit on the on, on those notes already, so to speak, on those points already. The illusion is that we are <laughs> we are run by governments, which means translated from Latin. You know, it's two words, governmenti, uh, mind control. Uh, they dictate how we should live our lives, what we should pay. Um and it's, it's all about deviating away from our true nature, all about that love and that awareness and that we are far more capable, capable than we have been led to believe. I mean, we get up in the morning and what do we do? We go to work because we have to pay our bills, right? And so mea culpa, I mean, I do it too. And I've had many, I've worked many, many long hours, but it's when I say it's everything is an illusion, it's, it's the media feeds us things that are not truth. Yeah. So we live in this, um, we live according to the rules and regulation as an implemented by mankind. And, you know, we are all one. The light in each of us is the same, except our physical appearance is different. But what has happened? I mean, look at countries. There's such a big divide. There are borders. And people clash with one another. There are wars going on. And you think to yourself, but it's all been created. Yeah, this divisiveness to control the people. And the same with fear. Put the fear of God into people and you can control them. That's why, for instance, like COVID was a great experiment for what people call the elite. Uh, I don't really call them the elite, but um, yeah. Uh, and, and they saw, hey, wait a minute, we can control the people like that with fear, except they bombed in their faces because people are waking up now, which is brilliant. Yes. And, you know, to your point about the divisiveness and everything like that, another thing that people talk about is 
the notion of the yin and yang, the purpose of duality um, yes. and why, you know, even the bad stuff or what people perceive as the bad stuff or what people perceive to be divisive, they all kind of play a role in that. What do you think about that concept or is there a fine line between, you know, the yin and the yang? And then also, like you said, you know, putting fear out there into the world and there's a way to kind of be in the yin and yang without so much chaos. Is that what you're trying to say? So, you know, uh, it's funny you mentioned yin and yang. That's actually going to be out in my second solo book. I talked about that. <laughs> so, I mean, yin and yang equate to like the the, the shady and the sunny side of um, uh, sides of life's polar opposite opposites, right? So it equates to balance. You can't have yin without the yang. You can't have light without darkness because you need to understand the, the polar opposites, the dualities. So yin is black and yang is white, um, but actually you know, they're not completely black or white. Just in life, just as in life, things are not completely black or white, but they cannot exist without the other. Just as what I always say, you know, nobody's actually full of hate. It's merely that rejection uh, for a love of themselves. So people shun the light within themselves. And they remain on that trajectory of suffering from the demons of uh, what we, what I would call their unhealed experiences. So whilst the yin actually signifies the dark, um, the passive, the downward, what you call, you know, the cold um, and, and weak. And the yang um, uh, on the other end is actually just very bright, very active. It's mm, It's hot. It's also expanding um, and it's strong. So, but there needs to be like what we, what I call a harmonious flow um, between these two energies. So it's like expand and contract. Um, it's like the temperature changing from hot to cold or like the ebb and flow of water on, on a beach, for instance. Yeah, but nothing remains imprinted in the sand. Um, nothing lasts forever. And so it's the same with our experiences because we actually need to release these, as I always say to the winds of change. Why do we hang on to stuff? We hang on to so much stuff, Yumi, and it we stump our own soul's growth. So life is just actually what I would say, a continuous flow of, uh, of constant balanced energy. Um, but it's actually our mind that just muddies the waters thereof. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. And then I, we wonder why we're so buggered up with this ease within ourselves. Yes. I. Th the more I look into all of these things, the more I realize that life really is about flow and, and balance and integrating what some people might consider to be the shadow aspects of life with ah. the more light aspects of life. And, you know, the question that I asked you is, is a bit deep and you know hard to kind of answer in such a short time but I, I like how you kind of you know explain that with the yin and yang it's not that one side is completely white and one side is completely black there is light in the dark side and then there's yes. darkness in the light side too and again it's that whole notion of balance so um switching gears quickly I wanted to also ask you about the Anunnakis because you you touch on them in the book, right? And yes. some people have said when it comes to seeding the planet and all of that stuff, some people have said that the Anunnakis have played a role that, a role in that. But then when you yes. look at it from a religious context, the idea of the planet being seeded by aliens potentially throws a lot of people it for a loop right because it's like no well god created us so i know that you wrote that in the book and i wanted to know why you wanted to call that out and if do you believe that the anunnakis which are these ancient aliens for anybody who who's listening i think they we first heard about them from the sumer the sumerians yeah. um so yes i just wanted to hear your thoughts on do you believe that they seeded the planet and how does that play into your understanding of 
why we are currently living out this reality on earth? Love that question. Yeah, the Anunnaki did create us, but they weren't the only we <laughs> they weren't the only creators who created us. I you're right. I always say we were created by we were created by like, oh gosh, how do I put this? <laughs> it's such a tongue twister. Yeah, it's a lot, yeah. <laughs> Creator created other creators to create us in turn for us to create and experience life. And that's like, oh my gosh, there is a God, but God is energy. We are God creators. We are, that. that's the whole point of it. We are creators. We are God. We are an extension of God's source energy. And that's why we're capable of so much more. And the Anunnaki, yes, I have channeled them. And um, uh, I've, uh, you know, um, but it's not only the Anunnaki who created us, there were also other beings. Um, that's why we're so, so vast. We're so different worldwide because we are a mixture. And I think that is just beautiful. But yes, the Anunnaki did, did, did have, uh, they, they were advanced engineers, incredible. And um, I always have said the archangels um, who we see as winged beings, uh, because that's how they portray themselves, not exactly to me, but um, they, some of them were Anunnaki. And of course, they have transcended. And when we go into archangels, when you split up the wording, you have arc and angels, when you have arc and then the H. And so I remember Archangel Raphael telling me, and I was just floored by that. He's like, arc means spacecraft. And then you have the H and angels. We are celestial beings of the heavens, which means we are star seeds. And they have transcended consciousness millions of years ago. Um, and it's quite inc it's quite incredible. Um, whereas when we go into like Michael and Lucifer, Lucifer is the builder of, of civilizations, but in the Bible he's depicted as a villain. Well, he doesn't really care, you know. I mean that that's fine. And Michael, um, Michael did nuke part of the planet. Yes, uh, I mean, but I mean again, he's transcended in consciousness, uh, and I found that so fascinating. Um, I found it fascinating how um, what they call like the Garden of Eden. So the Garden of Eden, of course, was the Earth spiritual school um, of the Sacred Heart teachings of actually living in oneness, harmony, and in that balance, that equilibrium um, with every everyone and everything according to the law of one. But it does stand for um, it's. A, Earth's Discovery Exploration Network. Uh, that's that's what it was. And um, when I I remember when when they said that to me, I'm like, oh my god, that's I never knew it was an acronym. Um, so that was very interesting. And how mankind were created, I, I you know they showed me like in in like test tubes, and it wasn't like like they got the ver the first version right. I mean, they kept um, experimenting. Uh, which was really, really interesting. And I think it's just amazing because throughout the galaxy, I mean, there are many more created species. Um, and I always say this whole, this whole, um, this whole multiverse, but this whole galaxy with all these different uh, planets and all these different uh, dimensions, it's just amazing how, well, there are architects that just create worlds and create different species, create civilizations, just to help um, expand the consciousness of not just, and that's, that includes us, you know, um, not just expand their own consciousness, but expand the universal consciousness. Because it's infinite, it's never ending. It's, it boggles our human mind, um, but it's, it's just fascinating. Thank you for breaking that down. So why did they create us? What was the purpose of that experiment? Um, <laughs> what was the purpose of the experiment? Yeah. Um, so for the Anunnaki, actually, they say that they had to mine here for gold. 
Um, I don't know how much of that is true. Yeah, because it has been written. I don't know about that. Um, I think there were many planetary wars going on, that's for sure. Um, especially the Lyrans, who became warriors uh, because they were attacked by um, what we call the reptilians or the draconians. Um, so, and and even the Anunnaki had a stake in that. But um, so they came to they came to Earth, and there have been many civilizations from Lemuria to Ad to Atlantis uh, to the Egypt. I mean, ancient Egypt. There's nothing left of it. Um, and we've lost so much knowledge, so much knowledge that we were given. And there have been so many lies, and that's why it's all that illusion. So much has been kept from us, um, just so that we do not go back to living in harmony with one another, that we remain separate, and then we remain under the control of uh, those in power, so to speak, but actually, do they really hold power over us? Eventually, everything will collapse, and um, we go back to living more in uni unison with Mother Earth and with each other, and um, being more interconnected, and listening to our inner wisdom, uh, our intuition, because how many people listen to their intuition? How many people communicate from the heart these days? Oh my goodness, Yumi. I mean, people are addicted to 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 their, you know, electronics. Um, but everything has been done so by design. I mean, look at the world that we live in. Prices have shot up. And people are trying to figure out how, you know, how to make a living. And for the longest time, we've allowed ourselves to be lived rather than that we are alive and actually living our lives following our passions doing stuff that we love instead we go on holiday what two two times a year maybe and and when we're 65 if we reach 65 or you know some people become older it's like well what if i'd done that what if i'd done that yes what if you jumped out that insane asylum i call it the insane asylum yeah that we live in or you what if you'd hop the fence and thought hey actually there's more to life and i've got to figure that out Yes. And, you know, it's interesting. I've been hearing so many people talk about that there's this war, especially the spiritual war between yeah. good versus evil and how they're really fighting for human consciousness, right? Because people talk about this whole notion of evolution, but not in a physical sense, in a spiritual sense, moving from, I don't know if it's the 3D or the 4D. I think sometimes people people skip over the 4D and say, like, we're moving from the 3D to the 5D and we're elevating consciousness and the earth is going to look different. And sometimes I think, you know, people always say that, you know, things are going to crumble, things are going to change, like a big shift is coming. But when you look at earth's history and for as long as you look at different civilizations, right, there have been moments where, you know, natural disasters occur, you know, genocides, like the most horrible things that you can think of, right? That yes. you're thinking, okay, this is the moment where, you know, a shift is going to happen, even from a religious context, Jesus coming and incarnating into this world was supposed to be that shift. So, you know, sometimes I always think what makes what's going on in the world now, you know, in terms of politics and, you know, we're, we're looking at the financial system, what makes that different from other times throughout our history where, you know, things hit the fan, right? So, that's also something that I constantly think about because people are saying like this is going to be one of the greatest shifts or you know expansions and I just you know what makes this time different you know what I mean you know it's up to the people when we want to make that change when we want to shift our consciousness we start with ourselves. We make the world a better place by starting with ourselves, by healing our own pain, our own trauma, of everything that we've been going through. So where I say where a lot of people are suffering now, it's all about sitting with that pain, feeling it, and healing through it. I don't care how you heal, whether you go and see counselor, or whether you go the holistic route, whatever works for you, whatever aligns with your spirit, but don't remain when the pain crops up. 
yeah evaluate you know evaluate it and analyze it and see how you can heal um and also i want to say this we live in, in a society where people just have their opinions and people are judged all the time you can't do this you can't do that and i'm just here to tell you to be who you who you want to be doesn't matter you know don't let the world dictate who you are but follow your own path and follow your own heart. And that's the most important thing. And yes, we've gone through, gosh, throughout time and history, we've gone through so many changes. And this will be a little bit different. It's not going to happen overnight because people are not going to awaken overnight. But there have been so many solar flares. I mean, I when people get headaches or they feel that there's a shift within them that is correct because it's also upgrading of dna some people may still be closed off to it and that's okay because how could we ever learn from one another if we vibed at that same level of consciousness we wouldn't and for the record america when you write down when you jot down the letters america and you jumble them around you get i am race America are the forefront, the forefront runners of the new golden age. And that's why there is so much, so much going on there right now. Um, it's quite incredible. Even on the political front, I I just smile. And um, it's quite incredible. And I think we live in such beautifully transformational times where we cannot go on the way we had any longer we just cannot go on like that um it's really about uniting um uniting with one another working with one another and understanding as i said that there's just so much more to life it's i think it's beautiful that doesn't mean it's always easy but it's still a beautiful ride and i think we're very we should be grateful that we are alive in this time during this time of change Yes, but you know, change to a lot of people can be scary, right? Oh, of course. You know, change isn't, like you said, it's not easy and it's disruptive. I think that's, you know, embedded in, in the word change. So I had somebody else on the podcast where I'm, I asked the question, I was like, well, how do we make sure people are not afraid if these changes are coming and if this is supposed to be this, you know, big thing for a lot of people listening to that, that might be anxiety provoking. Like, okay, so do I focus on stuff that I can't control or do I focus on, or do I just like not think about that stuff? Right. Cause I, I think you alluded to it about focusing on your internal world shifting your consciousness, focusing on your life, you know, fostering the relationships that you have in your life and not necessarily thinking about this change, but being aware that something is shifting. Yes, absolutely. Work on yourself. Don't listen to the outer chatter. Right? Don't listen to the TV. I call it a tell a vision because it tells a vision and it programs you. It conditions you. It makes you think a certain way about things. Uh, especially with the news and the media and all that, all, all that jazz. Uh, I don't even have a TV. You know, I live in my own cosmic bubble. I work on myself. When you work on yourself, yeah, and you heal um, on whatever change you want to make. And I always say, and you're right, change is not easy for people because they're so programmed to live a certain way. But they often wonder, you know, why do I not feel peachy in my own, own skin? Um, maybe I want to be like that person. Yeah, but look at that person. Look what they've got. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Look at yourself. Look at the reflection staring back in the mirror. And just be happy with you. And if you feel at a dis-ease within yourself, yeah, because we make ourselves ill. We often do that. And ill means imbalanced of love and light. That's exactly what it is. And so we need to regain that balance within ourselves and feed ourselves with that love and light and cultivate that joy from within. Everything starts from within. So whatever goes on in the outer world, it's not important. It's what's important, what goes in your, on in your world and how you can make the 
necessary changes from within. The biggest thing is fear. Fear is what hold, holds us back. But fear is something that we've created because we've listened to everything the outer world has imprinted upon us. And so are we going to, you know, are we going to step outside of these created lines um, that we've put ourselves in, in this box, and actually start to live our lives? Or are we going to remain as we are? It's entirely up to each of us. But everything starts from within. Do not wait for some savior to to save to 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 come and save you. No. Yes, everything starts from within. And you know, since I've been on this journey, I realized that in fact the my reality and how I view the world, my perception shifts, but the shifts start from within my yes. my mind and my heart and my consciousness and my how I'm seeing the world and that becomes reflected back towards me. So I a hundred percent agree with you. Um so you say in your book, I am simply here to plant a food for thought seed and unlock one's own true potential into a better understanding of oneself and the universe. I am a mere way guide, a compass for you to get your tangled bearings right. I'm here to help you live the life you have always envisioned by unveiling your soul's purpose. Mine was trial and error as I got hung up on my experiences, but I eventually figured it out. So there are two things there that I want to quickly touch on. Because a lot of the stuff that you're talking about is very out of the box for most people, right? Yes. So why is it important for you to plant this food for thought? And what were some of the experiences that has brought you to where you are now? So I call that, uh, I, I alluded to it earlier, you know, plant the food for thought seat. Um I'm not a Yosemite Sam, you know, holding a gun to someone's head. <laughs> it's really about... If that little seedling, if you read my book or part of my book and that little seedling sprouts and you think, hey, you know what? There's more to life. And actually, you're right. You're right. Um, and maybe because there's some exercises in there as well. Huh, maybe I can implement some of these in my daily routine and see what happens. It's not up to me. I'm not here to change. I'm not here to change any, anyone. It's merely... I wrote this book to inspire other people, that's it, and to help awaken humanity. Um, so, yes, and I've been through a lot of trauma. I will put it in a, in a nutshell for you. But um, when I grew up in Singapore, Malaysia, Malaysia, I was molested by a friend of the family. Uh, I was actually my dad's business partner. And, you know, I in 1980s, life was very different, Yumi. Um, so I just bottled it up. I didn't understand it. I just didn't, didn't know. And, um, when I was 14, my dad passed away from coronary heart disease. He was 44 years old. Um, I, I mean, I, I was bullied in high school. Um, I was already kind of starving myself, just threw away my homemade sandwiches, but I ate nicely at the dinner table. I started working when I was 15 just to help my mom out with the rent and my my sister as well. We still went to school. And then my mom put me on a modeling course just to crack up my confidence because I was really walking around like the hunchback of Notre Dame. I didn't want to be seen. I had this immense ingrained fear of boys. So if I had to go to a classroom and there would be a boy in the hallway, oh, you can get your bottom dollars. I would try and find another route to the, to, to the classroom which is insane, but that's how fearful I was. And so my mom put me in a course, a modeling course, and uh, that that didn't help because as I always say, one bit of trauma creates another bit of trauma unless you heal. And of course I, I didn't. And then I got picked out for a hair show um, to be one of the main models. And he took my hair from my shoulders all the way into a pixie cut. I felt so ugly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh and then when i was in my uh 20s my um in 2000 my stepdad passed away he had cancer and i always used to go 
when I was living in London at the time, I used to travel to my mom's every weekend just to help her out. And uh, he, uh, yeah, when he crossed over, my mom was leaning on me emotionally and I had a group of friends that uh, were into drugs. And so I rolled along with it for like three months, but I suffered from blackouts, uh, memory loss. And then I had sex with someone and I didn't even know anymore. And that was a real wake up call because that's just like, whoa, that's just going too far. And trust me, I mean, I was working during the day, but um, I just went cold turkey from one day to the next. But still, I just, I just kept going. My superpower in life was not eating and working like crazy and that was me playing Houdini with my emotions um, because I kept it bottled up inside and so I rolled into several dysfunctional relationships because that's of course that's what happens and um, I think in 2009 is when I hit rock bottom and uh, my ex was a part-time crack addict something I really didn't know um and I had bought him a plane ticket from the US to Holland, where I was living at the time. I had a good job. And um, yeah, and then all of a sudden, he just went off the wagon. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'd never seen someone on crack. And crack hands, and I, I tried to help him. We even went to see to several clinics, but they refused to take him on because he didn't have a social security for Holland. And uh, Danny got it got from bad to worse because he uh, landed at landed in bed with the Crips, the Dutch Crips. And I mean, he had pawned from me and he had stolen from them apparently. But uh, what happened was, I mean, I was so far gone. I was in this fight or flight mode and um, I did help the police and they did find my ex and they deported him back to the U.S., uh, my mom had helped me move from Holland to the UK because she'd been living there for several years because my stepdad was English. And so she found me a place and um, I rented that for several years. And then the leader of the Crips called me and because, you know, I I'd, and I helped the police. He said to me, if I ever, ever find you, he's like, I'm going to kill you. And that shook me to my core. It really, really did. And... I just downed a whole box of ibuprofen. But all that did was for me was just get, give me a good night's sleep and a uh, headache gone. And so my mom said to me, Brigitte, why don't you go and see a counselor? Actually, my ex is doing this, you know, he beat those demons uh, years ago. But I went to see a counselor. And um, at the end of that session, all the counselor said to me was, Brigitte, you're strong enough, you'll be fine but they didn't cut it for me. And so I had to figure out another way. And it's kind of like how I rolled into uh, Reiki. I had I found a Reiki practitioner. And mind you, many years ago, I, um, I mean, I used to read tarot for people. So I was already, you know, on kind of the holistic track, but I found a Reiki healer and she really helped me, really helped me and make me see that I, for the longest time I'd just been a doormat to people because that's what I suffered from and and still many years after that I suffered from doormat syndrome because I was always afraid to speak my mind I was such a people pleaser and I was so scared that people would think you know badly of me which is insane which is insane because how can you live when you're always worried about what other people think of you but that's just how society is that's how it's been cultivated and I was that, I was the same, um, you know, I mean, my, 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 my self-worth was down to shoot any, anyways, it was, but um, yeah, so I, I mean, I studied so many healing modalities after that, because I was really like this SpongeBob, I just wanted to absorb and to understand more about life and more about healing modalities. So I also studied uh, the emotional freedom technique, which is so powerful, yet so simple, because you tap out the, um, you you tap the emotions out of the trauma so that you can just talk about it and move forward. Um, and I studied aromatherapy, aroma touch, meditation, um, and several other healing modalities. But that wasn't the end of the road for me because the universe was like, oh, well, she's, she's learned from this one. 
well, let's see, why don't we, why don't we wrap it up a little differently and just send her someone else? Oh my goodness. And that was really, that was a trip. This guy was a trip. <laughs> and that was several years later. And um, he was just so controlling, so possessive, moved from an hour away to two doors down from me in a house that I bought in St. Petersburg. And uh, he suffered, he had a, a reckless unraised belt and he didn't pay it. Um, but it, and then his mother passed away, bless him. And he just fell into that depression. So he didn't want to lose me. And he was just in his fear of losing me. He was just, you know, pounding on me. And um, he admitted that years later, he's like, you know what? I should have just worked on myself. But again, I was in that fight or flight mode. And I, do you know what? Mea culpa, because I always tried to help them out. You know, I was a broken bird, but I was trying to fix these broken birds. So I was always looking for them for, for jobs, uh, paying their bills, um, just trying to help them out, you know, so that they would get back on their feet. But you can't help someone if they don't want to help themselves. It's like you need to let them drop to 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 that to the bottom of that rock, so to speak, and just let them hit their heads so that they finally wake up and change and you know make the necessary changes within their own lives. Because we always try many people try and fix other people but we always say this if we do that we stump their growth their you know and but we also stump our own growth because what are we doing we're hurting ourselves and we can say yeah but that no no this person hurt me no if i'm going to hold up a mirror to you and you look at your reflection you're pointing at yourself because you make yourself feel that way and so i had to take accountability for my life it's insanity that I sold my home in Florida to get away from him to buy another home, which was a money pit. I can't even tell you, but I was often just lying on the floor in the dark, just crying and screaming at the universe saying, why can I not be happy? What am I doing wrong? I look around me and I see people that even from my school time are successful. They have a home, they're married, they've got kids. What the hell have I got? And that was the one thing my mom said, Brigitte, she said, you have so much life experience. You've traveled the world. You've seen things. Yeah. Nobody can take that away from you. And, but I was there on the floor crying and trust me, I was like skin over bones at that point. And when I'd met this guy, for whatever reason, my stomach, I couldn't stomach anything. And I could barely drink a cup of tea. It was bad. It was really, really bad. But when I was there on, on the floor, it's almost like the universe sent me a little breadcrumb. A little breadcrumb. And I listened this time around. Because what happens when we're in so much pain? Often enough, we have these blinkers on, like we can't figure out how to move forward. But I was at the end. I was at the end of my rope, honestly. And so my sister said to me, Brigitte, why don't you do combo treatment? And I thought, I'm just going to go with it. That was that little breadcrumb. And yes, I did. And combo healing is shamanic healing. It is, um, it's where a shaman, um, well, they scrape the poison from the monkey tree frog in the Amazonian forest. And don't worry, they, they don't die. They croak happily, after, uh, happily ever after. But... <laughs> Um, I went to see him. He was from Peru and he was up several hours north of uh, of me in Florida. And um, I don't always like to do too much research because I don't like to cap my expectations. So I went and he burned four points into my leg and then he put the poison on. I'm telling you, oh my God, <laughs> it was intense. It was physical. I mean, in 10 seconds, my head was on fire um and i had this ye yellow bucket next to me and you know i had to drink two liters of water prior to that i hate drinking water on its own i need to have orange or, or you know squash in it but i did and i was just purging and purging for four hours and i was running up and down to the toilet as well because it came out everywhere which is really normal and um thank god i took a change of clothes with me but so yes i went and took me four hours four hours and 
And he said to me, do you know why? And I'm like, no, why? He's like, because your ego goes battling so hard to stay in control. He's like, because you are so set in your ways. And um, that really, yeah, it, it, I mean, that was so amazingly powerful for me because it was so physical um, that I went home and I, I actually went two more times. I mean, not in the same week. You, you've got to be kidding me. I spread it out. But I made a whole bucket list of things that I'd wanted to do. So I promised my stepdad that I would run for charity uh, for cancer once he crossed over in 2000. Well, I kept re you know, happily running in my head for like 16 years until I finally said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do it. And I did. And I ran for not just for cancer, but also, um, you know, for, for other charities. And it was great. I loved it. Um, went skydiving because I have this fear of heights. I can tell you, I was nearly peeing in my pants, but <laughs> I did it. I did it. And the same with hang gliding. But then spirit kicked me out of my house um, like several weeks later to go to this fair. I'm like, I don't want to go. And it was like, no, 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 you got to go. You got to go. It was like this nudge to go out the door. And I did. And that's where I met my former mentor, uh, Alania Starhawk. And she was amazing. Um, she... She didn't know about my stomach issues. And it was very interesting because she, an Akashic record healer is someone who walks through past lives and helps you heal these aspects of your soul um, that have been, and often we don't know this, Yumi, because we carry parts of our old lives with us, so to speak. You know, we're multidimensional beings as it is anyway, but we carry that within our energy field and we don't realize that. And so in another lifetime, somewhere in the Middle Ages, where I was very well off, um, he was like a charlatan and um, he wanted to climb the social ladder and poisoned me with an arsenic type of poison, whatever it was. And under the guise of, I'm helping you to get better. But several months later, you know, I crossed over and that's why my stomach, I couldn't stomach anything. And that kind of clicked but what happened after that was very interesting because his energy changed my energy changed and he left me in peace you're talking about he your started, ex correct yes yes he just worked on his on himself and sorted out his own life um that was that was quite incredible um so yeah and i mean from her i also learned light um not light language um handling that was really so powerful to me because when I went to one of her workshops, everyone was sitting, you know, in a circle. I was sitting somewhere on the side because I'm just like that. And doing a meditation, uh, she would count to three. I was gone. And then half an hour later, three, two, one, I was back in the room. No clue where I went. But everyone saw their guides, you know, colors, send it masters, you name it. I saw diddly squat, not a niente, nothing. And so I was really upset. Oh, I was upset. I can tell you that. But she had this great exercise. And if people want to start channeling, or it, it, it's all you need to do is just get a, uh, an exercise book or a pad, notepad, and a, and a pen, of course. And just say to the universe, I am open and I am ready to receive. And rather than thinking about it, just write whatever comes to you. But my mind was so shocked at that time that it was like, I went home, got in the car, went home. And that's exactly what I did that night. Oh, my goodness. Just because I taught Reiki, you know, I attuned people. I uh, I taught other workshops. This was something, oh, my gosh, I sat at home, did that. And it just started to flow. Just started to flow. It was like old English prose. Um, amazing. And I was actually crying tears of joy. I was like, oh my God, I'm good at something. And from that point on, it was really like, I asked so many questions. It was all about self-healing for me. So important. Self-healing is so important um, because that's how we can change our lives. That's why also we change our perspective on how we see things. And things just start to flow easy, easier within our lives and flow towards us as well. And I asked so many questions. And then I had my cards and I thought, well, I'm going to, you know, whichever one it was, whether it was the ascended masters, the gods, the deities, um, the archangels, I would just pick a card and I would just 
ask them if they had a message to convey to me and with the ascended masters if they'd lived another you know incarnated on the earth if they could tell me something about their lives um and that's how i started out it was so so amazing what a powerful story and it's interesting that you touched on past lives and how you started channeling because I was going to ask those two questions so thank <laughs> you for addressing that ahead of time but what a powerful story there's something that you said in your story that really stuck out to me um, and this idea of you cannot solve other people's problems they have to solve it for themselves and someone told me once they and and it's it's stuck with me ever since and they said when it comes to people's personal growth and journeys not holding people accountable letting people get away with their quote unquote bad actions or trying to take away someone's pain is doing a disservice to that person because correct unfortunately in this life we learn through pain and discomfort that's where we get a lot of our learning and growing and healing from so trying to stunt someone's not necessarily stunt it you know consciously but trying to solve that for someone is not allowing them to evolve or grow the right. way that they're supposed to grow and also in in that light too I think there's a level of accountability that you know, we also have to take within ourselves, like to your point of wanting to solve everything for everyone, but you were basically sacrificing yourself and you were also playing a role in that, in those interactions, right? In in that situation that didn't feel so good. And I think a lot of times it's easy to point the finger at someone and say, well, you're doing this to me, which they are, you know, a lot of times, but it's also about how we are interacting in that situation and what we are allowing to happen and how we see ourselves in that situation that also creates the conditions for us to experience yes. such harsh realities. So I really like that you called that out. That stuck out to me. But what a powerful story. And it, it makes sense that having been through so many trials and tribulations, you have this newfound perspective that I think continues to heal you and you're trying to spread that into the world like you can't tell people what to believe in but you can nope. plant the seeds and you can give a new perspective and if it falls on the right ears maybe they'll be like oh okay well I'll think about this a little bit more than I typically would have thought about it before in the past yeah and just because you know we go through trauma in our childhood which may not be our fault at the end of the day when we grow up it's still our responsibility to heal do we not owe it to ourselves to live a fulfilled life yeah i always say to people listen you're a beautiful soul you are enough never think that you are not enough because you are and yes we learned so much through our trauma through our suffering which if I hadn't gone through it, I wouldn't be who I am today. Am I grateful for my experiences? Absolutely. Absolutely I am. Because who I am now and who I am still becoming, I mean, everything in my life has been just invaluable. I am, I have nothing but love for everyone that's been a part of my journey and that's still part of my journey. And that's the one thing that I had to learn a lot was also to forgive myself. And I've forgiven other people. Um, and have that compassion for myself because fly me I used to box myself to a pulp in the boxing ring that's what I did <laughs> I really did and I had to just learn to love myself and just be more gentle with myself as well um, because we constantly you know I don't know how many thoughts race through our mind every single day but it's just, you know, take a back seat. And it's also very important to ground ourselves. Many people don't do that. Um, but when you ground yourself, you're so present within your body. You're so present within this moment right here and right now. Yeah, we cannot breathe in the past, Yumi. We cannot breathe in the future. But we can breathe in this present moment. And this is where we create better tomorrows. 
Thank you for saying that. I love what you said about giving ourselves compassion. And in order for you to give yourself compassion, you have to look at the parts of you that make you physically ill, right? <laughs> you have to look at the mistakes that you've made in the past, the things that you've done that you're ashamed of. And I found that when you're able to look at what some people might consider the shadow aspects of themselves or the more harsher truths and realities of who they are, you actually grow in compassion for other people, right? And mm -hmm. I think the more you look at your short, what you perceive to be your shortcomings and give yourself mm -hmm. grace and forgive yourself, I think that's the hardest thing to do a lot of times is, you know, forgiving yourself. And I recently, a couple of months ago, actually, about a month ago, I've been doing a lot of, of work on myself too. And part of my journey was like learning to forgive myself for certain decisions yeah. that I made. But sometimes those things come up and I just found myself so angry at myself because you think about the time that you've wasted. You think of why didn't I do it then? Why did I say this? And a lot of times, like you said, like we can't breathe in the past. We can't go back to the past and change it. Um, and even in the future, that's not necessarily guaranteed. But what is guaranteed right now is this present moment. And what I'm really trying to focus on in this like new era of my life is to stop looking at the past and mm -hmm. to think about the future, but not be um so bogged down by it that the this present moment and the things that I'm learning the things I'm experiencing you know pass me by so I appreciate you for calling that out yeah, yeah so <laughs> okay so the the last thing I really want to touch on because I you know this passage caught my eye because it has the title of the podcast in it and we've talked about life and the potential seeding of the planet we've talked about growing and evolving so I think the next best thing to talk about which is something people contemplate all the time is this notion of death right and you touch about that you touch on that in your book right so there's a passage that says as we are shifting dimensions that's what caught my eye because that's the you know title <laughs> of the podcast and humanity is transitioning and stepping out of that denseness that once was, we need to step away from the ingrained morbidity of death. I may show compassion, but as St. Germain has impressed upon me, what kind of teacher would you be if you felt sorry for the people that have lost someone and um, Molly coddled them in their state oh. of grief, right? Yep. Um, and there's so much more there, but when I came across this passage, because another thing too is I, you know, research and look very deeply into near-death experiences. So I'm fascinated yeah. about what is life after quote unquote death. And, you know, nobody really dies. Our soul just transitions somewhere, where, somewhere else, right. whether you believe it's in heaven, whether you believe it reincarnation, whatever. Um, but, you know, the, the notion of grief and not not I guess feeling sorry for and maybe this is more metaphorical than actually you know mm -hmm. you being literal here but I wanted to kind of expand on what you mean by this because at the end of the day even though we know death isn't final and some people most people believe in some sort of an afterlife it is still really sad to lose someone in the physical form yes absolutely so just wanted to get your thoughts on what you think death is and what you think the purpose of it is and how people should kind of think about it from your perspective that was a lot there but I hope you <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying well, to ask isn't, isn't, death, isn't death just merely the reawakening of the soul back home that's what it is you know we're here to experience the experiment of life uh, we've signed up for this We've signed up for this. We may not remember this because we come in cold turkey. You know, we get hit by this Arctic blast when we come out the womb. But um, there is no death. And there are people, yes, you can grieve. Of course, it's normal to grieve, but it's not really morbid. I think that's just been so ingrained within us because the soul, when it leaves the body, graduates. And it goes into this, Mm. I'm calling it a chamber right now. Sorry. So, yeah. So they're calling it like a chamber, but it's uh, really your your life review. And you see, they see all the 
you know, all their experiences and they go through, well, could I have done something differently here and all that. But but the soul graduates. And when we remain in that grief, I mean, some people remain in that grief for years. But why do that to yourself when the soul is still there, but it's just in the room next door? It can see you. But because we're so closed off, we don't see the soul there that's really happy. And the soul wants you to be happy. The soul wants you to move forward with your life. So even though I say it's okay to grieve, don't take years because it doesn't serve you. What are you doing with your life when you have so much life to live still? Thank you for sharing that. Well, this has been a great conversation. Um, we touched on so many different concepts and I appreciate you for sharing your perspective and you've given me a lot more to think about. So thank you. And I'm sure the audience was very entertained and intrigued and um, hopefully got some enlightenment or some, some deeper things to think about from listening to this episode as well. So thank you for that. I have to ask you, have you shifted in perspective on anything recently? And it could be as lighthearted or as deep as you want it to be. Oh, yes, I have. <laughs> Do you think my experience is stopped? No, I'll tell you something. Um, last year, I uh, probably worked an extra five months on top of 12 months uh, for my corporate job. And uh, I kind of burned out, but I kept going. And what did I do? I mean, I was probably, again, borderline depressed, but I just that's just a label to me. I don't really care. It's my emotions, my responsibility. I have to deal with it. I've always been like that. Um, but I also lost a lot of weight because I didn't eat properly. Yeah, that's my mechanism. And I felt such a responsibility to my work because I had two full-time roles within the company. But it wasn't, that wasn't working for me anymore. That was insane. I was trying to do my spiritual work too. You know, writing another book. And I, I just, and then the universe kind of nudged me, Brigitte, it's time to move to Spain. I'm like, what? So, so I did. I looked and I found something. And even though the house has got a lot of um, issues, I did move to Spain. I moved to Spain with the tail end of the flu. I can tell you it was horrendous, but I, I did it. Um, and then I finally stood up to my side, to, stood up to the company and said, look, I cannot do these two full-time roles anymore. This is too much for me. Yeah. Um, it's not doing my health any favors. And... It hasn't. I'm actually, truth be told, you mean, I'm on antibiotics right now and I do not like Western, phar you know, pharmaceuticals, but my rosacea had flared up so badly. It started in November. Yeah. And because um, I was still working like crazy and I could only keep it at bay for so long. And then last week, it just, I, you know, uh, not last week, the week before I started to get blurred vision as well. And, um, I thought, you know, I need to go see a doctor. And uh, now it's slowly coming down. And she just said to me, they're really different in Spain. They're really different to the UK. And in the UK, when you go and see a doctor, it's really difficult these days. And um, often they'll sit there behind, behind their computer and they'll check the symptoms on Google. That's really how it is there. But this is really, she was superb. And she's like, oh my gosh, she's like, you should have come earlier. Uh, yeah, but you know, I'm not really, I'm, I'm aware of a, you know, I like the holistic approach, but um, so every, every time I go through something and, and trust me, when I wasn't eating, I was very much aware. It was, I was conscious of it and I knew I didn't want to go on like that, you know, like this. So, I mean, yes, I do yoga now. I do my exercises. I, um, I run, um, but that's just for me. And um, yes, I'm also doing a course by, I, I love this guy on Mind Valley, Jeffrey Allen, about you, harnessing your spiritual energy and making that work for you. But there are also healing aspects to it because trust me, oh my God, it's, I'm still a work in progress. Perfect. Oh, underneath all these layers, we're, we're perfect. Our light's intact. Um. But we are constantly evolving here on this earth and we're constantly learning and we're constantly peeling away the layers. And yes, I'm okay where I'm at now. I'm present in the now, I'm present in my body. 
I ground myself every single day, but I'm still learning every single day. And yes, my ex experience is sometimes pretty extreme, but it's okay. It's okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for sharing that. So just to make sure I fully understand, you went from kind of shying away from Western medicine and you know yeah. having to deal with the system when it comes to that, but understanding that sometimes they do it. It does play a role, and it is necessary it to kind of you know go to the doctor and yes get you know treatment and all of that stuff so yeah thank you for sharing that perspective where can people find you if they want to learn more about your work if they want to buy your book or if they just you know want to listen to more podcasts that you've been on yeah so just before I, I I'm gonna I just want to hit back on that thing before I tell you what yes you can find of course <laughs> is that it, you're absolutely right holistic the holistic approach and the the traditional approach um do go hand in hand together um so yes i do i do believe in that uh i'm just more of the holistic approach that's why we get to, yes to this western pharma you know this traditional med and the kind of the antibiotics has hit me <laughs> really hard but that's okay it's it's fine um so where can people find me um on powersoulhealing.com and they can find my services because i'm also a light language healer People often ask me, what's, what's light language? And I'm like, well, you know, on conscious level, you're not going to understand it. It's like minion language, you know, gerbil language. But your soul understands these light codes just beautifully. And I'm so, so humbled to be able to do this. Um, it's incredibly powerful. Um, I've seen some beautiful results. Uh, and I just, I really, really love it. So, but... You can also find me on Instagram under Universal Light Warriors. And yes, I have a YouTube channel um, where you can also find most of my interviews um, and a lot of light language transmissions. They're normally three or four minutes long. Um, and that is on the Power Soul Healing. Thank you so much for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. It was a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for having me, Yumi.